we could go ahead and everybody get a seat and, and get started with a meeting here today. Um, welcome to Rome, those of you that are from out of town, and, and welcome to Berry College. And um, I think this is a, a beautiful venue here uh, that's part of a about 30,000 acre campus, the largest campus you'll ever see. There is a, a little tour afterwards for those that can stay. I know the the house members have some sort of event with the Atlanta Braves, I think, that uh, they're, they're going to, but they'll be running out of here quickly. But I would like, before we get started, if Senator Albers could do us an invocation. Thank you for this beautiful morning in this beautiful facility where we can sit down and discuss the important matters that are coming before our state and ultimately to serve our people. Lord, we just ask you to give us your wisdom and your guidance and your understanding. Uh, as we deliberate through these important questions, and we ask you to continue to bless our state and all those who serve it. For it's your most holy name, we make our prayer. Amen. Amen. So we'll introduce the, the members here shortly, but first I wanted to have Dr. Briggs say a few words up here from Berry College. He's been here quite a number of years, and I saw where Berry College was again named the number one best value in college and universities in the southern 13 states. A great campus here, and a um, little bit of uh, trivia as well. He went to Wake Forest, the same as my daughter, my older daughter that's now at CDC, but they, much, much earlier in the career was Dr. Briggs' honor professor, and then very late in her career, she was my daughter's honor professor, and I believe she was your inauguration speaker as well here when, when he came to Berry College. So I'd um, like to welcome Dr. Briggs here to say a few wor words to you. First of all, it's Steve Briggs, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Barry. How many of you have been on campus before? All right, and the others have, okay, so um, let me start with, uh, um, we will do a brief tour for anybody who wants to see the main campus. We're on the edge of campus here, uh, but if you want to see the main campus, there'll be a 30-minute tour by bus uh, uh, afterwards, and a couple, of, a student, a couple of folks there to, to show you around. Uh, this is Martha Barry's home place up on the hill. Um, some of you, if you watched Sweet Home Alabama, uh, may have seen the backyard is where the wedding occurred. And uh, so it's a, um, we've done Return to the Titans here. We've done Stranger Things just recently. Last year we did uh, Tyler Perry's new movie, 6888. So, uh, so we are very interested in your conversations about uh, the film industry and incentives and those sorts of things. It's been great for us. Martha was a remarkable woman. She educated 10,000 students, uh, high school students primarily during her lifetime, started a college, was the first woman on the Board of Regents, I believe, and never went to college herself. Think about that, 1902 to 1940. Um, she, uh, she really believed in the power of education as a way of giving students opportunity, and she really believed in coupling that with practical work experience. And that's what we still do. We great academic experience, great work experience. I love this building particularly. It was built about six years ago, five years ago. Uh, one of our alumni gave us the gift to build it, designed it, and every piece of wood you see in this room, and there's wood everywhere, inside and outside, painted and unpainted, he crafted in his uh, mill shop down in Florida and brought it up to us. So, uh, you know, the power of <laughs> his on-campus work experience became his life's profession, uh, even, uh, as a, as a well-educated student. Uh, today, three quarters of our students, some fun facts for you, you probably don't know, and we love to think of Barry as an integral part of Georgia's higher education system. Three quarters of our students come from Georgia. Uh, over 60% start their working careers there, another 30% do graduate degrees in the first few years. Um, uh, we have about 2,200 students all together. Um, the 93% of our Georgia students are HOPE students. They arrive. Uh, average debt at graduation, uh, only half of our students have debt. The half that do have debt average is 26700 which is pretty comparable to the average debt at graduation at UGA. So we don't have the state funds to support all of that, of course, but we do it through our endowment and through dedicated endowment scholarships for our students. But we also ask them to chip in a little bit. So 80% of our students work every semester on campus. Uh, they work in IT, they work in graphic design, they work in the business office, they work in the dairy, uh, they work at the equestrian center, they work in the president's office. We have seven students right now that work in my office every day. 
Uh, so we are delighted to give them practical, professional experience uh, to prepare them for, for their lives uh, uh, here in Georgia and elsewhere when they graduate. That's why we think we uh, uh, do well in these external rankings. For us, it's about um, providing the character and the quality of a residential college experience, which is a nice complement to the, ver the other kinds of educational experiences that are available here in Georgia through the state system. So we believe in a public-private partnership in higher education, and I'm delighted to have some state legislators in the room today to be able to make my <laughs> appeal that you care about us as well, because we do a lot for Georgia, and we care a lot about Georgia, and we'd like you to know us better. So we're delighted that you're here for that reason, and uh, uh, we hope you get to enjoy the day. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Briggs, and I'm, we've got the president and CEO of the Rome Floyd County Chamber here, Pam Power Smith, if you want to come up and say a couple of words before we get started as well. Thank you, Chuck. Welcome everyone to Rome and Floyd County. We're glad that you're here. Thank you to Chuck for bringing everyone here today and choosing Barry College um, for this. We hope you enjoy it. I do encourage you to take the tour. If you have time, short driving tour after this is over today, especially if you won't have another opportunity to come back to Barry College. Um, like I said, I'm excited to see our local folks here and our guests here today. Um, I know today's gonna be a good opportunity for everyone to talk and give a, their information and opinions. Um, thanks to everyone that came in last night. We appreciate your hotel room dollars. Um, I know I, speaking on behalf of tourism, we appreciate that. For those of you that stayed at the Fairfield, know that that tennis center that you saw is a project with Barry College, indoor tennis courts. So we host lots of fabulous um, tennis tournaments here. I think a lot of our local volunteers were super excited recently because a lot of the players they met here were playing at the Open in New York. So they were super excited to see that. Um, also, thanks to Barry College for giving you your coffee. I know that's the most important thing for most of you when you walked in today. So thank you for that. And please let us know at the Rome Floyd Chamber of Commerce if we can do anything for you or if you have any questions for us in the future. Please come back to Rome and Floyd County. You can stay with Chuck if you need to. <laughs> um, please enjoy our downtown, our trails, and our waterways. But we're just excited to have you all here today. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. And uh, speaking of the Tennis Center in Wake Forest, the ACC has their tennis tournaments here. Uh, I think it's every other year now, but they've, they've been here. And it's been really nice to see the, the Wake Forest logo on the corporate jet coming in with, with the team to, to play games here. It's a massive uh, complex here. I know uh, uh, Kirby Smart has a son that's big into it, and so he's out there playing tennis a lot. And many other people are coming into to the community. So let me introduce our panel members. We've got two remotely, Senator Bill Cowsert out of Athens, who is a chairman of Regulated Industries, and then uh, Senator Greg Dolezal for South, for South County is, is uh, remote with the meeting today, and he is the chairman of Transportation. Uh, the panel over here, we've got Senator John Albers, who chairs our Public Safety Committee out of Roswell, Georgia, and he is also the vice chair of the Finance Committee, so he and I work on finance issues a lot together and he had a study committee uh, years ago that really I think started the process of doing better evaluations of our credits. Senator Blake Tillery is the chairman of appropriations. He's in charge of spending all the money and um, nice uh, lawyer out of Vidalia, Georgia. And a little bit of trivia was his family, there's a lot of Tilleries here in Rome and Cedartown, his family originally was from Rome, and I'm giving away my age, but his dad was in elementary school with me um, many years ago. I was in the third grade, and he was in the sixth grade, and we were on the football team together, and back then, we didn't have leather helmets, don't think that, but but we, we uh, they didn't have this peewee might midget, when you're in the third grade, you just play with the sixth graders and get beat up by people like his dad, but um, he, he has Rome roots here and lots of, of family here. And then uh, Senator Michael Doc Rett out of Cobb County, has been the legislature, I think, maybe five, six years now, um, and and uh, has been a, a great addition to our Senate. So that's that's the panel from up here, and I will let my counterpart in the House Ways and Means Committee, Chairman Shaw Blackman, do your introductions if you want to. Mr. Chairman, I, I just I do want to say 
thank you to uh, Roman Floyd County for uh, hosting us and, and certainly Dr. Briggs I mean you have a beautiful campus thank you for, for hosting us here it's a wonderful place um, I'll start down at the end we have with us the chairman of our appropriations committee Matt Hatchett out of uh, Dublin Georgia and next to him is representative Debbie Buckner and over in West Georgia can I say Columbus area and um, from the Dalton up, upper north um, West is uh, Representative Casey Carpenter, Chairman Casey Carpenter. He chairs the uh, Entertainment uh, Committee, I guess is, uh, is probably the shortest way to put that. And then the Chairman of Higher Ed to my left, uh, Chuck Martin. Um, all have been serving for, for quite a good bit of time and uh, really appreciate them willing to be here and serve on this panel. Representative uh, Bruce Williamson could not be here. Uh, and I don't know if he's dialed in or not, Chairman, but um, anyway, been, a, been a, a long time good member of the House. So thank you all once again for hosting us. Chairman, um, back to you. So I, I talked about Senator Albert's committee from years ago, and we had uh, Pew Charitable Trust as part of that process when we started evaluating uh, all these incentives. And I remember at the time they were saying, well, there's three buckets states are in, those that do a really good job, those that do a fair job, and those that do a poor job. And we were in the bucket of a poor job, and so we've tried to work on making them more data-driven since that time. But they were, they were very helpful in, in us uh, starting some stuff that we did and, and looking at these things to make sure they're cost-effective, that, you know, that they're being used in an appropriate manner, and uh, that we, we have them to get the best incentive out of them we can. So we've got Allison Wakefield here from Pew that will be our first speaker, and we'll, we'll talk to you about uh, the work that they do, and I, I think probably many of you are familiar with them, but, but Pew works in all sorts of areas around the, the country um, working on issues that, you know, that matter to people. So we're glad you came down from, I believe, Maryland. Is that where you're from? And, and glad to have you here with us. One mistake before Allison gets started, please come on up, Allison. But uh, Representative Mitchell Horner is also sitting up front with us today, another one of our members. So I don't want to forget him. Thank you for being here. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's been a pleasure spending a bit of time in Georgia and especially on this beautiful campus. Um, I work on Pew State Fiscal Health Team um, with a focus on economic development tax incentives. Uh, Pew has been working in this space for more than 10 years. And before I start, I'll just say that Pew does, is, is agnostic when it comes to tax incentives. We don't take a position on whether they are good or bad. But we do believe that policymakers should have access to good information, just as with other types of government spending, to be able to make informed choices about um, their programs. So um, today I will be talking about why states should evaluate tax incentives, giving kind of a national context um, for, and how Georgia fits into that. Um, I'll talk about some best practices in incentive evaluation um, with a focus on upfront analysis for, um, for new programs if they are proposed, um, and then some examples of how states have used incentive evaluations to improve policy. So as, as I'm sure you are aware, <laughs> tax incentives are something that get a lot of play in the media, they are constantly talked about, they are one of the primary tools that economic developers have in their toolbox um, to strengthen their state's economies. Um, they are also quite costly in the billions of dollars collectively across the United States and it's rising over time, um, as is the size of the average incentive package. Um, we found that evaluation is a proven way to improve the effectiveness of tax incentives. And evaluation, as we define it, is both a look at the cost, the effectiveness, um, and some other economic terms that come into play. But it is not the same as an audit 
or a tax expenditure report. It kind of merges some elements of both, um, but adds in fiscal and economic analysis. So incentive evaluations are a way for policymakers to identify which programs are working well so that you can continue investing in them with confidence. You know they're working, let's keep doing it. Um, we've also found that when it comes to incentives, details matter. And incentive evaluations are a way to identify subtle changes that can have big impacts on the effectiveness of a program. There's also an opportunity to repeal or replace ineffective or obsolete programs. Um, the economy changes. What businesses need changes over time. A lot of times incentives are passed, they kind of just become part of the tax code, they're not revisited as other government spending is. They may not be meeting the needs of businesses any longer. So this is a way to revisit and make sure that they are serving the needs of the economy and the state's businesses. Um, it's also a way to identify whether um, the beneficiaries are those who lawmakers intended. Are they going to the areas of the state that were intended? Is it going to the industries and the businesses or the people that were identified as a part of the target um, market? And then it's also a way to kind of bring a baseline to the conversation around incentives. It's often a very polarized conversation. Yes, incentives, no incentives. This is having incentive evaluations brings common data and a point of, a common point to begin conversations that are constructive and can move policy forward. So when we started working in this space, um, there were five states that did regular evaluations. Um, Fast forward to today, there are more than 30. We're, the majority of states have some sort of legislatively mandated incentive evaluation process. Um, for us, this shows that there has been interest and hunger for more information about incentives, and, um, and lawmakers are taking, taking steps to make sure that they have that type of information. Um, Georgia is a, in a little bit of a gray area, um, thanks to SB 6. It is certainly providing you all with more information than you have had in the past about your incentives, but it, as we de define an evaluation process, it doesn't quite hit all the marks. So for us, a, what we consider an incentive evaluation process is having a plan to regularly and rigorously evaluate the full portfolio of economic development tax incentives, um, nonpartisan analysis, that, um, that some sort of evaluation office produces on a regular schedule, um, and then having a connection to policy making so that the reports are actually used and put, put to the benefit of the states. Um, so Georgia can request, in Georgia, um, lawmakers can request a number of incentives to be evaluated each year. Um, it's at their discretion, which gives flexibility, but there is some uncertainty about the next time the, the programs will be evaluated, um, how you can track changes over time to effectiveness if policy changes are made. And then um, it's, it's nice to be here at this panel today um, to talk about the, the results of incentives, but um, there could be a stronger connection to policy making uh, that comes out of the incentive evaluations. The, Profile of who does these evaluations differs across the country. Um, it could be um, independent agencies, legislative staff, le in a few cases legislators themselves are the evaluators. Those tend to be states that have longer interim sessions um, where they can really dig into the details of, of their programs. Um, and then in others, outside experts like universities or contractors are the ones that produce the evaluations, usually overseen by some sort of government committee or commission. Um, so here I have that Georgia, through the um, Department of Audits and Accounts, produces contracts with um, universities to produce their analysis. The scopes of the evaluations, meaning what, in, what programs are evaluated, differs across the states as well. 
In some, it is the full portfolio of tax expenditures. In others, there's a focus just on economic development tax incentives. And then in others, depending on a state's portfolio of incentives, they may include cash grants or bonds um, in their evaluation process. It depends on the number of, of tax expenditures that, are, uh, that exist in a state. If you have hundreds and hundreds of tax expenditures, it may just be unrealistic to evaluate all of them. It may require adding additional staff capacity if that was of interest. Um, if, but, but Pew recommends focusing on economic development tax incentives because those are often um, more discretionary or um, not used for um, things like to address like tax pyramiding or, or other um, accounting principles. So um, as was already mentioned today, there, Pew has been involved in um, the conversation around tax incentive evaluations and has been happy to provide our resources um, to the state of Georgia for, for several years. There was, in 2017, um, with Senator Albers, there was a, um, the Senate Special Tax Exemption Study Committee, um, which led to several rounds of proposed legislation. And in 2021, there was SB 6 that was passed. Um, and in 2022, the first round of evaluations resulting from SB 6 were released um, through contracts with Georgia State the University of Georgia and Georgia Southern University. And then here we are today in 2023. So for us, I referenced this um, quickly earlier. Oops, sorry. Um, incentive evaluation best practices. Um, what we look for in determining the quality of an evaluation um, we think that evaluations should include a description of the incentive along with a history so that um, there's a, a, view, a historic view of how the program may have changed over time and whether those changes uh, reflect you know, what is actually desired for the program, um, an assessment of the design and the administration, estimates of the expenditure's economic and fiscal impacts, and there are certain things that we like to see as a part of evaluations in that, in that bucket, um, and then policy recommendations. That's um, a really important area, um, and sometimes we can see states get stuck without having some sort of direction from the analysis. It's, it's great to have economic modeling and lots of numbers, uh, but if you're not sure what to do with that information, it can be, help, it can be hard to know where to go next. Um, and we've seen states either provide direct recommendations um, to lawmakers of how to improve effectiveness or provide um, a framework for questions to consider as, parts of, as a part of policy conversations. In Montana, for their tax credit review panel, they have a form that has a set of standard questions that uh, lawmakers discuss for each review so that there is a common framework to discuss and analyze the incentives. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, they provide recommendations, but they also provide questions for lawmakers to consider so that they're not being too directive, um, but also pulling out key information that can help um, address needs or, um, or some of the nuances that may otherwise get lost in the reports. So these are some of the, the economic concepts that we like to see incorporated into the economic and fiscal analysis. Um, displacement, leakage, timing, opportunity costs, and but for. Displacement considers whether growth in one sector or at one business comes at the expense of another and therefore negates um, perceived benefits. Leakage has to do with the amount of, of economic activity that may get exported outside of the state, um, which could happen if a supply, if a, if a manufacturing supply chain, for instance, is largely located outside of the state um, and has to import um, goods and services for their, for their activity. Timing, this one's not quite as um, uh, obvious. Um, there is a connection between predictability and costs for the state 
and also with the effectiveness, depending on the timing, or especially with the length that an incentive is offered. Generally, the longer an incentive is available to a business or can be claimed, the greater the uncertainty for the state about when those costs are going to hit on the, the budget, um, and it can make monitoring more challenging. Um, there's also um, research that indicates that really like 20 year incentive packages um, are not valued as much by businesses as shorter ones because a, a dollar today is worth a lot more than a dollar 15 years from now. So having a reasonable you know, five to 10 year um, package is often viewed more um, favorably or will have a greater impact than ones with very long um, time periods. Opportunity costs, if you spend in one place, you can't spend in another. How is that being taken into consideration, um, often in terms of state budget expenditures? And then, but for, which is kind of the question that we all ask, um, does the tax credit or incentive change business behavior? Um, no one has a crystal ball to be able to answer that question, um, but we've seen a lot of really creative ways that evaluators have tried to estimate this because we know it's between zero and 100. It's probably not 100%, it's not 0%. It had some level of influence. It probably didn't influence 100% of the business decision, so therefore you should not count 100% of the jobs and 100% of the investment as the full economic and fiscal impact of the program, um, adjusting it based on um, based on different types of economic uh, concepts like sensitivity analysis or elast price elasticity or just um, kind of logical uh, logical assumptions about you know. Uh, whether it makes sense logically that the incentive would have influenced behavior. We, we've seen this in Massachusetts, for instance, just to give you an example, with their film tax credit, um, they take out any productions that were for local uh, productions that, that really are, were like Boston or Massachusetts specific, so things having to do with the Red Sox or the Pats, um, because those have to take place in Massachusetts. and were not likely to have been influenced by the incentive. Okay, so connecting evaluations to policy making, this is a really important one. Um, how can we get evaluations to be used? One way is to um, include sunsets on programs so that there is a regular cycle that um, stakeholders are aware of and can be prepared to have conversations around um, and that there is a plan to have some sort of conversation um, about the incentive. Um, some states also treat their incentives like other spending. With other government spending, the, the, the budget process is an opportunity to reconsider the spending that goes along with those programs um, and that is not the case usually with tax incentives. They're passed, they kind of sit on the tax code um, and are often not revisited, which is why we think evaluations are important. Um, so some states have started treating them like direct spending and budgeting for them through um, appropriations like other programs. Uh, Florida is, is one state that does that. They set annual caps through their budget process for their programs. Maryland is another, um, and it gives some certainty and that costs won't expand beyond um, the state's, the state's um, expectations. So caps, like I was just explaining, are a part of that as well. Putting some sort of limit on the amount that um, the state will have to spend each year um, to provide uh, fiscal certainty. Legislative committees are um, one of the strongest ways that we've seen to bring evaluations into the policy making process having conversations like this to discuss the results um, and digging into the details um, leads to really substantive policy conversations. Um, in other states, they use recurring commissions that are citizens commissions or um, 
where people are appointed by, by the governor, by the House and, and the Senate, and um, bring together people with different perspectives and um, experiences to, to debate the, the incentives. Um, and another way um, that can be really useful is finding avenues to incorporate stakeholder input into the evaluation process and at every step of the way. So ensuring that evaluators speak to the stakeholders that benefit from an incentive, hear their perspectives about how it's working, what are maybe some roadblocks that are making it less effective, um, getting a really deep understanding of how an industry works so that when they're doing the analysis, it is informed by reality as well as um, you know, their, their knowledge and expertise as well. Um, then during the, if there were hearings, having people um, coming and you know, transparently having conversations around the incentives and again, using that baseline data for conversations is really valuable. As I mentioned, it can be kind of overwhelming to receive a really huge report and then try to figure out what to do next with it. Um, we have, there are several ways that um, states have addressed this, as I've mentioned. This is a set of questions just as some examples of how policy conversations could be structured. Um, like, is the program designed to achieve its intended goal? Um, does it duplicate other programs in the state? Is it aligned with the state's economic development strategy? Um, incentives should be viewed as a tool to help move the state in the direction it wants to go. It is not the deal, like an individual deal is not the end point. It's part of a, part of a larger um, strategy. Um, if on the front end for considering new tax incentives, um, there are lots of opportunities to kind of make sure that some things are addressed on the front end so that they don't become problems later on. Um, so making sure that an incentive, a proposed incentive has a clear and measurable goal. What are you trying to achieve? How are you going to measure it? That will also facilitate evaluation later on, making sure that you're collecting the data that will be needed for evaluation. Um, is the incentive designed to meet its goal? Are the proper targeting definitions in place to make sure that the people or businesses are claiming the credit within the time frames um, desired. Uh, again, the details with incentives really do matter. Um, and then how will we know if, how will you know if you're making progress towards your goal and that's where evaluation comes in. So through our research, we found that there are a couple of ways that states try to do this and bring some sort of framework around the discussions of new incentives. Um, and they've done this by establishing principles for designing tax incentives, developing procedures to consider proposed incentives in a deliberative manner, um, or conducting upfront analysis of proposed incentives to forecast their effectiveness. Here is an example from New Mexico of um, the tax their tax expenditure policy principles that they use as a part of their fiscal impact statement and they go through and identify whether a bill has been vetted, meaning has it gone through some sort of legislative committee, is it targeted with a clearly stated purpose, long-term goals, measurable targets, um, is it transparent with annual reporting, is it accountable through public analysis, um, meaning evaluation. Is there a sunset? And what is a, you know, a sense for its effectiveness and um, efficiency? Does it, is it likely to fulfill its stated purpose um, and influence business behavior? That can be a challenge on the front end, but it's worth having those conversations. So I'm going to finish up with some evaluation success stories um, to give you an example of what this looks like in practice. In Alabama, um, they had a historic rehabilitation tax credit that had, was evaluated, but it had sunset in the time that the evaluation was conducted. 
Um, however, the evaluators found that it was an effective program and was having um, beneficial outcomes to the state. So lawmakers, with that information, decided to restart the program with some reforms that made it that were recommended by the evaluation to make it um, more effective moving forward, including uh, switching from a first come first serve process to um, one that was competitive, so that all of the applications could be compared against each other um, and chosen for what was likely to yield better outcomes. In North Dakota, um, they have, like many states, an angel investment tax credit. Um, the evaluation uh, identified a flaw with the program design where um, a lot of the benefits were leaking outside of the state to investors who did not reside there. Um, they did not completely close that, but they reduced down um, or they changed the, the program so that it was better targeted to investors who lived in North Dakota. Um, angel investment, just by its nature, tends to have investors from all over the country, the world, um, so they didn't want to completely um, close that, but they did want to make sure more of the benefit was staying inside the state. Through their evaluation process, they also um, created a new incentive. They realized that in looking at their portfolio of incentives that they needed, there was a gap um, in the state's programs and they recommended creating an incentive to assist businesses in moder modernizing their manufacturing processes. And in 2019, they created the 21st Century Manufacturing Workforce Initiative. And in Nebraska, um, their signature incentive program um, called the Advantage Act uh, suddenly had rapidly increasing costs to the state and it was going to start affecting the state's budget if they didn't do something to, um, to address that. It was also scheduled to sunset, so it kind of forced a policy conversation um, for them um, and, and led to their evaluation process. The Legislative Audit Office cited several um, inadequate fiscal protections on the program that was leading to these rapid cost increases. And so when, um, when discussing a replacement program, the Imagine Nebraska Act, um, they included yearly limits on program costs to keep, make sure that it didn't escalate beyond um, their expectations. And the Legislative Audit Office also did a pre-implementation audit, so sort of like a front-end analysis um, and found data collection improvements um, that, were, that were enacted into law um, to be able to answer key questions about effectiveness, such as are the benefits going to the rural areas that they had in, as they had intended in the program design? Um, are we collecting data about the workers so that we know if they're coming from other states or if we're helping um, employ Nebraskans? Um, it was, it was a really nice complement to the work that they had already done on the back end um, to, to facilitate improved um, efficiency on the front end for the new program. So I could probably talk about this all day, but I'm sure you're tired of hearing me talk, so um, I'll just say end by saying that we have many, many resources available on this topic, and we love talking about it, um, and we are available to answer questions, provide technical assistance and research, connect um, with other states. We also maintain a database with the National Conference of State Legislatures of um, evaluations from across the country, and there are over 300 evaluations in there from um, over 40 states, so it, it's quite the treasure trove. So thank you very much. Um, are we taking questions now, or? I'm on here. Thanks, Allison, for the presentation. And you know, we have, as you've seen, tried to go in this direction of, of better evaluations. It's it's a giant ship that's hard to turn sometimes, but uh, we're we're trying to be more data driven in what we do. So, any of the panel members' questions that you've got for Allison here, uh, Senator Albers. Th thank you for your help over the over the years and the great work that Pew does. You know, in Georgia, we have. Uh, certain bills that lay over for a year. Uh, as an example, if it impacts retirement, 
uh, or if we're creating or considering creating a new city, things of that nature, we've got procedures in place. Are you aware of any other states that uh, I really uh, appreciate the proactive approach of looking at a tax credit, especially a new one, before it goes into place, that, that have some type of a process that may have a tenure involved in that prior to then getting in front of a General Assembly for passage? I'm not aware of that, but it's something I could look into. That'd be great. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Chairman Hatchett over here, I think you get a mic. Yeah, you got one. Thank you, Allison. Um, I just wonder if you could give us more details about the Nebraska Advantage Act. More, was it for a specific industry or just more details about it? Can you? Sure. Um, the Advantage Nebraska Act was actually a portfolio of incentives. So there was a job creation incentive. There was um, a research and development tax credit. Um, it, it, it was made up of a whole bunch of different incentives. Um, and they evaluated each component of that. The, the most costly element of the program was the job creation incentive. Um, and so when they created the Imagine Nebraska Act, they put um, greater controls on, on especially that part. Thank you. You want to go first? Go ahead, Chair. I defer to the Chair. Defer to, to, to the other chairman. <laughs> this is so romantic. <laughs> no, I, I'd be happy to go real quick. I just, it, it, I, I, you've had a lot of great examples, great presentation, and appreciate your, your assistance clearly with uh, some of the evaluations we already have in place. Um, I was just curious on some of the storylines. Do you ever find that some of this metrics, you know, that, that states are looking at, they, they peel back on some of these and that they lose a particular industry or they lose some businesses and, and, and you have the, those other side of the, of the fence, so to speak, stories where, um, gosh, I wish we hadn't have done away with, or we hadn't have curbed this or mm. we hadn't have done that. Is that part of the portfolio or? or? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm not aware of that coming up. Um, more states are starting to enter their second round of evaluations. So they've done their first one. There might have been policy changes. And now going back and revisiting them will probably lead to some of those conversations. Um, but we haven't kept as close track on, on that element of it. Um, but that is an interesting question to. Well, I, no, I, it was a small little part, but I just, uh, you know, great, great stuff. We look forward to talking with you more, Allison. Thanks for the presentation. And, you know, I will say that, again, this evaluations are an opportunity to revisit what industries qualify. Are those still the industries that the state wants to target? Um, is a tax credit or an incentive the best way to support those businesses? So, um, so I will say that we have seen states um, modify the industries that they're targeting because um, with their incentives because their economic development strategy has shifted to focus on other businesses. Makes sense. Thank you. I think I get to go next. Um, thank you, Allison. In the evaluation, it seems like the, the meat of it and the disagreement always ends up being on, uh, you know, was it a, would this have happened anyway? Mm -hmm. on the but for analysis yep. and I've not heard yet anyone say that there is a but for analysis that people <laughs> I know they're never all gonna agree but that people generally agree on mm -hmm. have you found one place in our country where folks can at least come to a consensus on how that but for analysis is is, is uh, employed so like there is quite a range of ways of estimating the but for um, and it how evaluators do it will often depend on how much data they have and what type of data they have uh, in Rhode Island they do a cost benefit analysis with a break-even um, analysis as a part of that so they can say if the incentive is responsible for X percent of the activity the state will break even on its investment, and above that level, they Great. receive a, a positive benefit, and below that level, there's a, a negative um, impact. 
depending on how high or low that percentage is, it gives you a sense for like, oh wow, at no point will this ever break even. Or um, if it's really low, then, and it only takes 10% of the activity, then you can say, that seems reasonable. We're willing to, to, to move ahead with this incentive because 90, it's likely that 90% of um, the incentive, 90% of the activity is, is probably because of the incentive. So it depends on the program, depends on the amount of data that's available. Um, with discretionary programs, it's a little easier to do that type of but for analysis because there is some sort of award process that is used to, um, to make decisions. So you can do a marginal analysis, basically where you look at businesses that are just above the cutoff and just below the cutoff in the scoring. So those who just barely got an incentive and those who did not, but almost got an incentive and compare their outcomes over time. Um, because presumably they're somewhat similar to each other. And um, then you just have a, like a better sense of whether the incentive is really driving um, you know, better outcomes for businesses than if they didn't get an incentive. Um, like you said, no, no one has a crystal ball. Um, and, but there, there are strong policy conversations that come out of even just having like some sense for the likely effectiveness so that we get beyond this like yes, no um, conversation. That's a combination, and I think the answer and, and a good one of, of a but for and, and an ROI type investment. You kind of uh, rolled in into the answer. Um, what I agree with Senator Tillery on is the the but for question is always there. Is it, we we say you know the, the people that are looking to come here says if you don't do this we won't come. Mm -hmm. um, we don't necessarily always know that because I mean we, we've. And I appreciate everybody that's decided to locate in Georgia. I, I use this as an anecdotal example, not one. But I, I still contend some of those decisions are being made because units three and four at Vogel are coming online and they know they're going to have reliable, you know, clean, um, low cost energy. Okay. That's something they can't get in, in other states. So when you get down to the point of how much was the economic incentive and, and so forth, or if you're, you're trying to recruit something that's going to, uh, need access to a port. I mean, you're obviously you got to you're, you're not gonna you're gonna put that somewhere on the coast of Georgia or somewhere on the coast of South Carolina. So, is there has there ever been some criteria lay, laid out that says, hey, you know, if you've already decided to locate here, you, you can't say if we don't get the incentive because you already bought the property. I mean, do you ever find states that say, hey, if you've already started an investment here, we're not gonna loop out and include mm -hmm. you in this incentive you weren't otherwise included in. Yep. But, okay. That's, yeah, that's so so that's that's a really good example of like where the details matter. Um, in Texas, they one of their primary incentive programs has stipulations that say you cannot have signed a lease, you cannot have bought property property, you cannot have cannot have started advertising jobs. They have all of these kind of like common sense things built into their incentives that indicate whether or not um, uh, a business had already decided to locate. Um, and if, if they find evidence that through their due diligence process on the upfront, on the, on the front side, that, um, that businesses have done those types of things that indicate they've already made a decision, then they don't qualify for the incentive. Um, in New Jersey, <laughs> an audit found that um, as, as a part of the application process, businesses had to show addresses for locations that they were considering. And there was this one office location that continually showed up on different business applications because it was available and it was right across the river in New York. And um, 
it was clear that this was kind of like a dummy property that businesses were using to show as evidence um, that that they were considering other locations, but the frequency that it was showing up indicated that it, they weren't really considering it. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I've, I want to try to wrap my head a little bit around the opportunity cost mm -hmm. um, analysis and do. I mean, obviously, we've sat in committees before, and we've heard that every dollar that the state of Georgia spends on transportation, it, it brings ten dollars of economic impact. The question is, how do you, you know, obviously, you get to a point where you're making a decision based on we've only got a finite amount of money. What do what do most states do with a, Do they have a list like, all right, if we put a dollar in education, we get two dollars return? It, how do how do most states handle that? So they'll kind of if. If they have access to a, a dynamic economic model like REMI or IMPLAN, um, they will model what the economic and fiscal impacts would have been had the same amount of money been invested um, in education or transportation um, and to see what the, the difference is. Um, other states will compare it to a Brought, will compare the incentive outcomes with broad-based tax cuts to see if one is more effective than the other, um, instead of just targeting specific businesses, give everyone a tax break. Um, uh, there was another one. I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, yes, so there's um, research by Dr. Tim Bartik at the Upjohn Institute, uh, who we've partnered with pretty extensively and he's put together a model that helps to show in like a very visual way how incentive design decisions affect outcomes. And one of, one of the biggest areas of impact is how the incentive is paid for. Is it paid for by reducing spending um, on things like education or is it um, paid for by raising taxes for everyone uh, to pay for for the cost, or is it a combination of both? And uh, what his research has found is that cutting education spending has over a over a long term period has really negative economic effects um, when they're coupled with incentives. So, you know, there there are several ways. I'm happy to share that research and the model yeah, afterwards. Better wrap this up now. Um, Ooh, I think we'd ask questions all day. Okay, one more quick question. Thank you. I have a question about cost avoidance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we give a tax credit that is helping in one area, it ends up, I think, helping us avoid as a state some kind of cost somewhere else. Is there a way to assess that and evaluate that as a part of the total package? Could you give me an example? Well, um, Let's say that we give some R&D or job credits, and instead of having to build the roads near where the place is, they do that for us. So we've mm -hmm. saved having to do that, but, but we've given a credit over here for something totally different. So I, I'm not certain that we ever capture if there's been an avoidance of, of uh, cost to the state, and yet we've helped them get established somehow. That's not a great example. I can't think of a better one, but. Trying to think. Um, nothing's coming to mind. I don't see why it couldn't be incorporated. Um, or if a company does broadband expansion around mm -hmm. their company and the community benefits from that, mm -hmm. and we haven't been able to do anything to provide that broadband service, that might be a better one. Yeah, I think that's, that's a question that I'm interested in as well. When, I will just say like, when we first moved into this field, there was so little literature on tax incentive evaluation um, that we, we basically helped build it up from the ground um, with the states that were doing the analysis. And since then, there's just you know, been an explosion in capacity to mm -hmm. be able to do this type of analysis. And um, so kind of had to like get the foundation set for the analysis. Right. And I think now there's an opportunity to start looking at more broader kinds of impacts like that um, as evaluation capacity has been built up over time in the states. 
But I will say that, again, Dr. Tim Bartik has research um, that shows that the economic conditions um, and um, income conditions, well, yeah. primarily economic conditions um, will lead to disparate, in, in a region and a state, will lead to disparate outcomes for people in different wealth quintiles. Mm -hmm. So if there is a very tight labor market, it's more likely that people are going to be imported into the state to fill the new jobs, which are, is going to raise um, income, but it's also going to raise costs, which is going to more deleteriously impact folks at the lower wealth um, uh, income, wealth quintile. If there's a lot of slack in the labor market, um, there are people that can be hired from the state, um, so there are fewer people being imported to fill the jobs, um, and the benefits are felt more widely, um, are, yeah, felt more widely despite no matter wealth um, levels. So that, that's a part of it, I think. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how evaluators delve into some of those things a bit more. Thank you for your information. My pleasure. Sure. Always great. Thanks so much, Allison, for the presentation. And, um, you know, we're, we're part-time legislatures, and this is only a part-time of our job, and it's nice to have groups like you that do this full-time and look at evaluations all over the, the country and bring this Thank information to us. Thank you very much, us. everyone. And, and a side note, I will add, since we talked about education, one of those apparently little-known facts is that Georgia's average teacher pay is the highest anywhere in the South from Texas to Virginia. So we are uh, investing in education. And I think, as the data says, it's going to pay off in the long run. So Nick uh, Stark, if you want to come up now, Nick is with the American Legislative Exchange Council and is our next speaker here. So I will, uh, in the interest of time, let you go ahead and get going. You have to give me one second, I apologize. I caught several spelling and grammar errors in my presentation. And uh, though I'm a product of the Oregon education system, I promise I know how to read and write. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee, for uh, having me here today. My name is Nick Stark. I'm director, director of Tax and Fiscal Policy at the American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, we are a nonprofit that is focused on um, educating and um, promoting policy ideas that are based in limited government, free markets, and federalism. Um, we have a membership base of, uh, nonpartisan membership base of state lawmakers across the country. Um, and you will see that we are, we were founded in 1973, so we are celebrating our 50th anniversary, so that's going to be riddled throughout uh, my PowerPoint deck here. Um, the main crux of my work at ALEC uh, surrounds our flagship publication, Rich States, Poor States. Uh, the main thesis of this is that tax rates um, and, and how you structure your tax system promotes economic opportunity and drives people to vote with their feet. Um, so we've seen this over the last couple of years, actually the last couple of decades, um, with mass migration from places like New York, California, New Jersey, uh, Illinois, that tax at very high rates, um, people moving from those states to places like Florida, Texas, Arizona, North Carolina, and of course Georgia um, was in the top 10 this year for state-to-state um, -state migration. Um, so real briefly, I want to run through the ALEC principles of taxation before I get into some of the tax credit stuff and how we, we kind of view tax credits broadly. Uh, the proper function of taxation is to raise money for core functions of government, not to direct the behavior of citizens or close budget gaps created by overspending. Uh, this is true regardless of whether government is big or small. Uh, and this is true for lawmakers at all levels of government. Taxation will always impose some level of burden on an economy's performance but that harm can be minimized if policymakers resist the temptation to use the tax code for social engineering, class warfare, or other extraneous purposes. A principled tax system is an ideal way for advancing a state's economic interests and promoting uh, 
prosperity for its residents, the goal of American tax policy should be to raise revenue for functions of government in a way that minimizes distortions so as to grow the, the overall economy and facilitate commerce. Now that's kind of our, our main statement. Um, I promise I will not read very long paragraphs off my slide deck the rest of the time. <laughs> um, but really briefly to get into some of the principles. So we've got uh, seven principles here. If I can count right. Yep, seven. Uh, simplicity, the idea that um, the tax code should be simple and easy for the common taxpayer to understand. Uh, the more complex it gets, the more it actually penalizes the government in terms of revenue, or excuse me, not penalizes, it, it doesn't necessarily generate more revenue for the government um, if it, the more complex it is. So the example of this is if I have a very complex tax system and I owe $5,000, but I don't know how to figure out that I owe $5,000, I'm gonna have to hire someone to do my taxes for me. Um, that then takes away that money for where I can spend it elsewhere and generate more economic activity. Um, transparency, we'll get into this a little bit with the tax credits, but the idea that it should be uh, accountable to the citizens and that changes in the tax policy should be, policy should be highly publicized and open to public debate. Um, economic neutrality, the idea that the, the tax system should not be set up to punish behavior or direct behavior one way or the other. Um, this kind of ties in with the concept of equity and fairness. Uh, that it shouldn't be, pick, government shouldn't be picking winners and losers uh, based on, you know, whether that's industries or firms or um, certain classes or anything like that. Uh, the tax code should be complementary. It should uh, maintain a healthy relationship between the state and local government. The state should always be mindful of how its decisions affect local government uh, and make sure that the two are not working against each other. Um, it should be competitive, I'll get into this a little bit later, but it should foster um, more economic growth in your state. Um, typically that's done through lower tax burdens uh, and that, that generate more economic activity. Uh, and it should be reliable. I should be able to know year over year kind of what my general tax burden is um, and it's, know that it's not gonna change drastically based on certain factors, uh, or certain unpredictable factors, I guess I should say. Uh, benefits of a principled tax burden, uh, like I said, you generate greater economic growth, um, which spurs greater wealth creation, not just among upper classes, but throughout all of society. Um, the more that businesses are able to make, the more they can pay their workers, the more that their workers can spend at other businesses, that then you can kind of see the chain there. Um, it also is a minimize, it also brings a minimization of micromanagement and political favoritism, which is where we'll get into with the tax credits. Um, when we're talking about the tax credits and our solution for how to kind of roll back some of the tax credits, uh, which is cutting rates broadly, um, the most important and forgotten lesson for policymakers regarding business taxes is that businesses don't pay taxes, it's the people that pay taxes. So what do we mean by this? Well, high business taxes result in higher prices in an effort to turn a profit. Um, when businesses, the, the taxation of businesses gener is viewed as a, um, as an expense that they have to pay, so then they have to pull that from other places that could produce more supply um, to lower prices or to, to pay their workers, that sort of thing. Um, high business taxes, taxes also move businesses across state lines. So uh, we talk about how people vote with their feet in favor of places like Georgia and Florida and North Carolina, where the tax rates are generally lower, uh, but, some, but it also impacts businesses. I think a couple prime examples of that were Tesla, uh, moving to Texas from California. Um, one caveat there that was largely based on tax credits and they are now moving, looking at moving back to California based on tax incentives. Um, but other th companies like Citadel recently moved to Florida from Illinois without incentives because the, the overall business tax burden was quite lower. Um, Caterpillar also did the same thing when they moved to, to Texas last year as well. Uh, when businesses move, so do the jobs and other forms of economic stimulus. So when you take the business out of a certain location, you're losing the jobs that that business created and you're, you're losing them to places like for Georgia, I'm sure if your business leaves Georgia, it goes to t Florida, you know, you lose that job economy in, in Georgia. Um, tax preferences can, tax preferences, I'll use that interchangeably with credits and expenses and, and uh, all that sort of thing, carve outs as well. Um, but tax preferences can move businesses, uh, but a better overall tax system is better uh, incentive through lower rates. So what are tax preferences? 
Um, there's a couple different uh, ways of viewing these. We're, I'm going to talk broadly, not just in the perspective of credits, but also in, the, in terms of exemptions and deductions and that sort of thing. Uh, tax preferences refer to the use of public policy to benefit a, a specific industry, firm, or individual, as opposed to setting broad and generally applicable rules and policies that apply to the society as a whole. Uh, this is the main reason that we, we support the idea of a broad-based tax cut um, rather than credits individually, is that because it's so specifically targeted, when you can use that funding that goes that is lost from the tax credits to cut rates broadly, you benefit all of society, and the taxpayers get to keep more of their uh, more of their uh, hard-earned dollars. Um, it's rooted in the belief that reliance on government planning to direct economic activity will result in greater economic prosperity than free markets can achieve on their own. Um, types of tax preferences, so. This is kind of what I was talking about with the deductions and exemptions and all that in addition to the credits. Um, targeted tax rates or cash subsidies for specific firms granted by so-called economic development agencies, uh, preferential tax treatment for firms located in a given geographic area, uh, punitively high or special taxes on some firms but not others, and then tax carve-outs that benefit certain industries or groups relative to excuse me, the rest of the tax base. So what tax preferences are not, um, tax preferences are not, excuse me, tax, I should say cronyism, not uh, preferences. Um, so cronyistic uses of tax preferences do not apply when, when you, how am I trying to word this? The practice of businesses utilizing existing tax carve outs to reduce their tax burden is not tax evasion or, or avoidance. Uh, it doesn't uh, fall under the category of what we, we classify as uh, tax cronyism. Uh, general across the board tax cuts also don't apply to this because it's intended to be across the board affecting all businesses, all um, levels of personal income, that sort of thing. Uh, what's wrong with preferences in the tax code? Uh, it creates market distortions. Um, so you can, it's a way of sometimes propping up industries or firms, businesses that aren't necessarily set up to succeed on their own. Um, we see this a lot, um, regardless of what you think about the EV industry, we saw one ex a couple examples of large EV companies starting to fail in the last couple of years that were um, kind of deemed to be winners by previous um, levels or previous, previous administrations, um, but they're failing, so clearly government is not the best arbiter of um, who's going to be winners and losers. Uh, more carve-outs means higher taxes, so I'll get into the Washington State and Boeing um, story in a second, but basically the idea that when you create the carve-outs, you then have to make up that loss of revenue in other ways. A lot of that comes through uh, raising taxes in other ways. Um, failures in central economic planning, so again, the idea that the government doesn't know how to pick winners and losers. Um, and then rent seeking, uh, with Amazon is a specific example that I'll get into as well. Um, the idea that companies go on the search for whether they can best be suited, and sometimes they have a specific location um, in mind, but they try to game the system how best they can to get the best deal wherever they can. Um, a fairer way of doing that is to just lower the rates, um, have it be a more competitive economy without the, the credits. So tax preferences have gone wrong. Uh, Amazon, Arlington, and New York City. So Amazon, a couple of years ago, famously uh, went through the process of searching for a new headquarters or a new city to relocate to, um, they garnered, they solicited um, certain deals from multiple cities throughout the nation, and New York City and Arlington ended up being the best deals, uh, but famously, New York City actually, uh, they, they decided to cancel their plans for New York City because of some of the feedback on the, uh, the cronyistic tax credits that were doled out to them. Um, the other point of this is that we, you, you don't always know like that a company is going to be uh, successful or sti stick to their commitments in, in certain instances. So the Arlington example, uh, just up the road from the Alec offices, they're building these big, beautiful buildings for Amazon headquarters. And they decided not to break ground on one of them because they basically had to lay off a bunch of people and they kind of hit downtimes last year. Um, so that, build, that lot that they had is kind of just sitting empty at the moment. Um, Another example is Washington State and Boeing. So Washington State doled out a bunch of tax credits to, to keep Boeing in the state of Washington about a decade ago. And what happened was that 
A, going left and came to Arlington, uh, but B, they raised taxes in other ways, um, and then a couple years later had realized that that was a really bad idea and had to go back and undo some of those tax cuts. Uh, and then the St. Louis Rams is more, that's, a, that's more of a subsidies point. Uh, Missouri is still paying the bonded debt uh, and for the subsidies that they issued uh, to the St. Louis Rams, who, as you all probably know, are now the, the LA Rams once again. Um, and then Oregon data centers. Uh, Oregon brought in a bunch of uh, tech companies to build data centers in um, the kind of the suburbs and farmland around, um, around Portland. And the promise was that these were gonna create a bunch of jobs, but the reality was that they built these massive warehouses to house these data servers that really employ only about 10 people per, per warehouse, as opposed to what they had kind of promised with, with creating hundreds of new jobs uh, in the area. Um, so specifically for Georgia, this is just a brief look. I pulled this from the, the Georgia Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. Uh, this is a look at the, the tax credit credits specifically with expenditures over a million dollars. Uh, so these are basically notable tax credits. Um, you can kind of see how that's shifted over the last decade um, to uh, what the dollar amounts are here with the personal income credits amounting to over, um, I think that's over four, one billion four hundred, one billion, one point four billion dollars, pardon me, um, in in lost revenue for the state. Um, so that's, that's a large chunk of the budget uh, when you factor that in. Um, and I know Georgia passed uh, last year a flat tax that was, I, I believe, about a billion dollars, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in tax breaks for the taxpayer by going to a flat rate. Um, that is, the rollback of some of these credits could create higher tax cuts and high, lower tax burdens uh, in the future to eventually bring some of those rates down as well. Um, so some of our solutions for fixing the tax code and getting some of these carve outs out um, is creating more transparency. So creating more benchmarks uh, and processes for review and evaluation of the new tax credits. Um, the idea that when you, if you provide a tax credit, you gotta, you gotta be able to account for what the economic um, advantages of it were uh, over the next couple of years. Um, part of this comes with also sunsets, uh, making sure that you know, they, they aren't just around forever taking up um, revenue. Um, I have to emphasize something with this next point. So cash subsidies, uh, the idea that instead of providing the carve outs, you provide cash subsidies for some of this. Um, this is rooted primarily in that concept of transparency um, it's probably not the greatest idea ever, but it is an alternative to putting s some of these tax credits on notice. Um, so that way you have to go through and budget and appropriate funds for these, what would have been a tax credit, you know, claimed without the, the without being in, in the view of the people essentially. Um, and then finally, eliminating tax carve-outs and reducing rates generally. Um, and I, I want to emphasize that that's probably the biggest one. Um, because it can create more pro-growth um, tax policies. So we've seen kind of a, a movement of states, as I mentioned, Georgia being one of them, um, cutting taxes over the last three years. Um, a total of 22 states have made cuts to the personal income tax alone. Uh, but there's been multiple cuts to corporate income taxes in places like North Carolina, where they decided to phase out um, their their income tax by 20 or their corporate income tax by 2027. So that's something that Georgia will have to compete with um, uh, in the future. Um, states can fall behind by standing still. This is something that we've seen in, in a lot of instances. I think of um, my my state of Virginia, uh, where I currently live, is one state that over the last couple of years has really fallen behind in economic opportunity because they haven't done anything to actually reform the tax code. Um, Colorado is another example of this. Um, really, the only thing that's kept them at bay is the Taxpayer Bill of Rights out there. Um, uh, but one of the, the primary ways of moving this forward is what we've seen last year with Georgia being part of the re resurgence of the state flat tax revolution. So props, props to you guys for, for that. Um, we, we think it's part of a larger narrative to push um, for probably the, the full elimination of the income tax in, in the future. 
Um, you can see here the personal income tax progressivity. So Georgia is set up, uh, we think, very beautifully to compete with some of the, the surrounding states. Of course, you still have Tennessee and Florida, which have no personal income tax. But having a flat, reliable, um, per predictable uh, flat tax is, is still a better um, structure than, than in like Alabama or South Carolina um, or even like Louisiana, Arkansas, getting, getting over there a little bit. Um, you cannot read that. Um, <laughs> I can't even read it here. So uh, basically, it's, this is just our economic outlook rankings uh, for 2023 in the 16th edition of Rich States, Poor States. Um, you can view this if you want on richstatesportstates.org or you can find it at alec.org. Uh, but Georgia, which you cannot see on there, is ranked 12th overall. Um, and this is, so you can kind of see some of the, the best of the best, North Carolina being number two, Florida being number nine. Um, and then the worst of the worst being kind of the, the typical culprits of New York, California, um, Illinois, New Jersey, those um, those types. But I, I really wanted to show this map here. So this is the taxpayers vote with their feet map. Um, and you can see that really the where economic opportunity is is prevalent and, and really in, in high quantities in places like, like Georgia, Texas, Florida, Tennessee, um, where the tax burdens are relatively low, that's where you're seeing people move. And it's not just because of, uh, it's not just because of the sunshine or the better weather. Um, I don't know if I'd want to live in South Dakota in the wintertime, um, but you know maybe the, the lack of income tax you know might incentivize me to move there. Um, so this is just the the hard numbers that go behind that, um, and then yeah I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. But the the overall point is that rolling back in in, in reforming the tax code to really remove some of the carve outs can be a better a better vessel of creating the tax reform that is necessary to create economic growth and uh, make make life simpler and easier for Georgians. So. All right, well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and I know you had North Carolina up there as number two, and I know they've, they've cut back on some of these, but we were actually at one time, I think, with a little bit lower tax rate than them. And we're going down, we're phasing down to 4.99, but I know they're they're going to be, I believe, in a couple of years at 3.99 and, and trying to get lower as well as the corporate income tax, which you said they've eliminated. On the other hand, Florida and Tennessee have a fairly high corporate income tax, different mm -hmm. strategies there. but um, And that's, yeah, and that's a great point not to interrupt you, Kurt. Go um, ahead. But that's a great point because the more competitive you can remain on the business front, like I said, could bring, can give companies that are looking to move out of places like New York better alternatives than Florida or Tennessee. And it could bring it could really bring them to Georgia instead. And of course, they they tax other things sales wise than we do at a higher tax rate. So it's 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 complicated. As you noted, we're at least doing well above average in the state, and that's part of this process. Is what's the best business environment we can we can create in this state? Okay. Any any questions from panel members? Just, just real quick, Nick, can you talk about? I mean, you, you compare tax rates, but. Georgia's a three-factor state, too. I mean, you, you choose the lowest factor on which to pay income tax on. Do you take that into account when you apply our tax rate versus someone else's? Because you can apportion um, based on your, your sales or your, your people or your, your assets. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can choose the lowest one to apportion your Georgia income. I, I just feel like I, I want that to be said in, in, in our business climate. It's, it's a good place to, to, work, uh, to work and do business. Yeah, so we base um, our comparison of tax rates uh, primarily on the top marginal rate. So, um, and, and a lot of the reason for that is that um, a lot of states or some states will, will factor in inflation when it comes to natural increases and how you move up in the brackets. But sometimes personal income just naturally grows in a state and moves people to higher brackets. That, so really the lower brackets start to become obsolete. I know we saw that uh, Kansas took a really hard look at the this year. Um, unfortunately, wasn't able to do anything. Um, but so for that reason, that's why we, we look at just the higher, higher rates. All right. Any other? Yeah, I got you one right here, Chairman. Uh, all right. I'm going to come back to this question again. So do you guys have any studies that shows, obviously, in the dream world, it's we just cut the income tax rate and everybody gets 
gets gets more money and that spurs economic growth. My question is, are there studies that say if I give a taxpayer a dollar, this is how much economic impact he's going to provide? Because to me, the theory would be if I have an opportunity cost that we've talked about already, if I can get a certain return on that dollar or second, certain economic development uh, inci that, that incentive provides, say it's 4 to 1, 10 to 1, whatever, but if I give the taxpayer a dollar and he, and he creates two dollars, it's still better for the state of Georgia to send money at the, at the four to one versus the two to one. And so are there studies that show how much, if, if, if you give a taxpayer a hundred bucks, he creates $200 worth of growth or $50 worth of growth, what is that? At, at that level of detail, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not certain. I know we, we don't have any studies on that specifically, but one of the ways that we account for that is um, kind of the comparison of what the outlook looks like and how tax rates change and then how one of the other factors for rich states, poor states, is economic performance. So it's driven by GDP, state to state, state migration, and then employment growth. Um, so what we use that for is to kind of point to the, hey, tax reform in the states that move up in the outlook rankings tend to also perform better. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think that my biggest thing is when, if you look at when the government gave all the stimulus money out during COVID, right? What, what, what happened? Did the average Joe that got a thousand dollars, what kind of economic impact did he provide to the economy? Was it we, we all went out and bought big screen TVs made in China, and it was a short run of 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 economic growth, or would that money would have been better better served to create? other opportunities with that the government could create so uh, thank you Nick for for being here my my question is if Alec isn't I didn't feel like you were trying to pick and say you know corporate and in corporate tax should be lower versus personal income tax if, if you're trying to evaluate them all though why would you not just look at what per capita tax rate is and say, and would that not be simpler way to evaluate all taxes overall and then rank the states accordingly? Yes, yeah, so that's one measure of looking at it. Uh, the reason we don't do a per capita ranking is because certain, uh, it's not borne out by all members of society equally sometimes. Um, so the, that's primarily why we look at the, we look at it um, at more of a per $1,000 of income level um, specifically when it, and not and not in these senses uh, with the, the personal but when we look at property taxes sales taxes and some of the other alternatives we look at it that way because it's a better estimate of how much of your your tax dollar or how much of your hard-earned dollars are actually going towards taxes okay. but I think that probably brings us more questions later on about this ask offline Nick, thank, thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for uh, everything you do with ALEC. And I encourage all my, my fellow legislators here to be a part of ALEC and the great work you do. You, you brought up something that was interesting about um, when you're going through different scenarios of some clients uh, or, or businesses that are opting to relocate just because of their overall tax structure versus necessarily certain incentives that are targeted for maybe a specific industry or a high growth area. Can, can you expound upon that a little bit more and do you see that shifting over time or is that a, a one-time phenomenon? Yeah, um, I think the biggest the biggest thing you have to consider is what's the cost of some of these firms of considering the tax credits and, and the incentives that are created. So uh, one of the things I can think of is you got to get the lawyers and the, the accountants and all those sorts of you know people to then take a look at the system and determine what's best for us in this deal. Um, but if you just have very low rates that don't require all, that are very simple, you're not requiring all of that, um, all of those, those expenses um, in order to consider those. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I noticed earlier you were talking about uh, tax preferences that go wrong, but there are examples of some of them that do work you know, working through development authorities. And particularly here in Georgia, you know, we have the film industry where they gave them a tax preference in the early 2000s, and it, and it still seems to be working well for Georgia. Yeah, so I was thinking about this. Uh, the, the historical example I actually thought of was the, um, the railroads, when the railroads were built in the early 1800s in order to create the vast network of things. Um, and 
the the problem is it, just because it's it's going well doesn't mean it's achieving as well as it could without the incentives. Um, because if you if you force some of these industries to to compete without the government incentives, they'll find inventive ways to survive that, that could bring more profits and more more economic growth and prosperity um, to the state overall, as opposed to just kind of sitting comfortably with just the incentives. questions I can't see over there it doesn't look like it so we we certainly appreciate you being here and for for giving us one of the many perspectives we see as we go through this process and uh, thanks for your work thank you around the country um, and I, I should tell you too I've got a daughter in Oregon working on her PhD at the University of Oregon so we, we know a little bit about that state now too <laughs> um, we've got uh, is Missy doing the next presentation kendrick if you want to come up and and get this uh going right everybody come up but if you would come up and get us going okay what whatever she says so Yeah, yes, I, I would like it if it, Yeah, I think so. Let me just move it a little bit if I can. Yeah. Missy, you okay there? That's fine. All right. You want to come back with it some more? I'm going to let somebody else move it because I'm, I'm going to mess it up. Tell me. All right, well, Chairman Huffstetler says I can get started, so I will. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Clay Jones. I am the Vice President and General Counsel for the Georgia Association of Manufacturers. We are the statewide trade association that's been representing manufacturers in our state for over 123 years. And it's beautiful to be here at Berry College today. I didn't realize I had a familial connection to Berry College until last night when my wife informed me that her grandmother uh, attended school here before it became a college when it was uh, the girls' school here, so uh, it's, a, it's a great place to be. With our roots in the textile and flooring industries, the association now represents manufacturers all across the state of Georgia in a wide variety of industries, including heavy equipment, chemicals, automotive, aerospace, steel, metal fabrication, pulp and paper, you name it. And I'm so proud to see so many of our, our members and, re and manufacturers here today. Uh, thank you all for coming. I want to begin by thanking the panel uh, and thanking you and your colleagues for the job you have done in making Georgia a great place for manufacturers to invest and to grow and for the work you're doing with this joint tax credit panel. I think it's a, an important work. I hope that the result of it is that we'll keep Georgia moving in the right direction. Before I begin my remarks, I want to introduce the other uh, individuals we have with us today on the panel. I'll let each of them tell you a little bit more about themselves and their companies, but I wanted you to know who we have uh, with us. Uh, we have Ballard Betts who is the president of the Lewis Chemical Company, uh, a small business chemical manufacturer right here in Rome, Georgia. Uh, Ballard also serves on our GAM board of directors. We also have Michael Edwards, uh, the senior vice president for operations for Mannington Mills, a flooring company with operations uh, across the state, including Calhoun, Madison, and others, Chatsworth. Michael serves two roles with GAM. He is our, currently the interim chair of our GAM tax council and also serves as the vice chair of our association. Also, we have with us Jason Burleson, who is tax director for Pirelli Tires, a company y'all might know, international company with production right here in Rome, Georgia. And last but certainly not least, uh, Missy Kendrick, who I'm sure everybody knows, the president of the Rome Floyd County Development Authority. 
So you'll be hearing from all of them. In my brief time with you this morning, I, and I'll, I'll help sort of moderate the panel a little bit, but, but in my brief time, I want to address with you three topics. One, the importance of manufacturing to the state of Georgia. Two, how Georgia is a great place for manufacturing investment and why we should maintain that status. And three, the importance specifically of the sales tax exemptions on energy used in manufacturing as well as other business inputs. So the importance of manufacturing. There are approximately 6,500 manufacturers in the state of Georgia, ranging from small shops all the way up to the biggest. They employ over 418,000 workers. That's 9% of our state's workforce. They produce $74 billion in output, contributing 10% to Georgia's gross domestic product. They create wealth and prosperity across our state because their products are sold not only here, but outside of Georgia and throughout the world. They pay their employees premium compensation. For example, during 2022, average weekly wages in manufacturing were approximately 1.1% higher than the statewide average for non-manufacturing employees. But very importantly, outside of the metro Atlanta area, in our rural communities across the state, uh, manufacturing wages exceeded non-manufacturing wages by 15.2%, critical for many of our local communities. And even that likely understates the premium that manufacturing jobs pay um, because of employer-provided benefit packages, which are significantly higher in goods-producing industries as opposed to service-producing ones. Critically for Georgia, manufacturing plays an especially important role, as I said, in our rural communities. In July 2023, manufacturing represented 5.8% of non-agricultural employment in the Atlanta metropolitan area, but outside of Atlanta, uh, it represents 13% of employment, so more than twice as much in the rural communities of our state. Manufacturing also produces the largest multiplier effect of any sector of the economy. When a manufacturing firm purchases products, services, and raw materials from local suppliers, employment at those enterprises is enhanced. Further, the employees of those manufacturers with their premium compensation spend their wages in local communities that support employment at a variety of other businesses. The U.S. Department of Commerce in 2021 determined that the manufacturing sector has a total multiplier, requirements multiplier of 2.31. Now, I'm not an economist, and I'm just a lawyer, uh, and so, what, and I'm not good with math, obviously, but what does 2.31 really mean? Well, it means that for every dollar of final demand for manufactured products, manufacturing generates an additional dollar and 31 cents in demand for products used to make those manufactured products. And of the 15 sectors of the economy studied by the Department of Commerce, manufacturing had the highest such multiplier effect. And of that $1.31, over 74 cents is spent for products outside the manufacturing sector. These are key industries for our communities across Georgia. And the good news is Georgia is a great place to invest and continues to be a great place to invest. Yes, for the new manufacturers that come to our state that we seem to talk a lot about in these meetings and what incentivizes people to come here. But I'm also here today to talk about the manufacturers who are already here, the ones who've been here, maybe for hundreds of years, decades or longer, and make decisions to maintain and expand their investments in our state. Georgia has a number of advantages. I've lived here my whole life and I've seen it grow and become even more incredible than it was when I was a kid. We've got the Atlanta airport, even though there's some traffic sometimes, there's a good highway system in Georgia. We've got the Port of Savannah, the technical college system, our institutions of higher learning, go dogs. Competitive energy rates, I do a lot of work representing us at the Georgia Public Service Commission, trying to keep those rates competitive so manufacturers can stay in business here. And importantly, and what I wanna thank you for today, the business-friendly climate that you have created that is exemplified by our tax system this business-friendly climate is a product of wise and visionary leadership that our state has employed in recent years to create a stable, predictable environment from a regulatory standpoint and critically for our discussion today, our tax system. Um, I was interested to see the criteria that Pew uses in evaluating these criteria and uh, how you look at you know, these incentives or tax uh, exemptions or whatever and, and one of the things I didn't see there although I think they listed some good ones but one thing I didn't see is competitive position where does this place us competitively with other states because for manufacturers uh, that is incredibly important they have investments they compete not only across state lines with businesses in other states outside of our nation's borders around the world not just in China but in many places around the world but also they compete within their own companies 
uh, for investment if they have locations in multiple areas. And Georgia has been winning a lot of those investments. Again, reliable, steady, pro-business tax system is very important. It helps ensure a level playing field against other states that aggressively try to attract manufacturing investment, and that contributes to our competitiveness. And it also provides confidence to all these manufacturers in the room because with a steady uh, system, they understand that hopefully drastic changes to our tax system will not be seriously considered and put us in a different direction. So because of the state's leadership, we've been on quite a roll. We've been attracting billions in manufacturing investment to our state. In fact, the issue that we really are trying to address right now is workforce. Every state is facing this. I mean, we're attracting jobs, and what we're really working on is how do we find a sufficiently sized skilled workforce to fill these jobs. That's, that's what we're focused on at GAM, and we look forward to working with you on that issue as well. Third, I want to talk about the sales tax exemption on energy and business inputs. Like ev nearly every state, Georgia provides a sales tax exemption for business inputs, such as machinery, equipment, replacement parts, and materials. There's some variation, uh, but almost every state uh, does. Over 10 years ago, we adopted what's called the integrated plant theory approach, which means that items are exempt from sales tax if they're integral and necessary for the manufacture of the product. And that took Georgia from being having one of the worst such exemptions in the country in that regard to having one of the best ones, and the results uh, speak for themselves. Subsequently, Georgia leveled the playing field for manufacturers by exempting from sales tax energy used in the manufacturing process. Energy is an input just like any other input, and manufacturing is an especially energy-intensive sector of the economy. Fully implemented from 2013 to 2016, this exemption brought Georgia into line with the rest of the country. We were one of only eight states as of 2013 uh, that did not offer an exemption on sales tax, um, uh, for sales tax on energy used in manufacturing, and all of our southeastern competitors uh, were already offering it. Taxing business inputs violates widely held tax principles, causes economic distortion, double taxation, tax pyramiding, raises production costs, and the consumer ends up paying it because if you're, the tax builds up within the costs and then it gets taxed again when it's sold. So we don't want to put our manufacturers in this jurisdiction at a competitive disadvantage, so we encourage you to continue uh, exempting those business inputs. So in addition to the sales tax exemption on business inputs, there are several other credits we won't have time to talk about all today, although we'll talk about some of them. The R&D tax credit, the job tax credit, the investment tax credit, and others. We thank you for helping to make Georgia competitive with other states and countries and attracting, retaining, and encouraging expansion of Georgia manufacturing. The great value of our tax system is that it's pro-business and pro-investment, but it's also stable and predictable. And I can tell you on behalf of our members that is critically important. Before I close, I, I would like to just address, I think, what has been the issue in the room in a lot of these meetings, which is the but-for question y'all were just talking about. The, they're going to come anyway. If you know, we, we take away some of these exemptions, some of these things that are important, that manufacturers are going to come anyway. And I think there was one study that said, well, only one out of eight of these jobs that came to Georgia uh, came because of the tax credits. Well, one out of eight is a pretty big number, first of all. So I want to say three things about it. One. One-eighth is a pretty big number. I don't believe that number necessarily because intuitively it doesn't seem right to me. But even if that number is correct, one out of eight is a big number. There are 418,000 job, manufacturing jobs in Georgia. One-eighth of that is over 50,000 jobs. One-eighth of $74 billion of contribution to GDP is over, again, not a mathematician, $9 billion, I believe. Uh, and it's not just the new companies, again. It's the ones here that make investment decisions every day in their boardrooms because some of them have, many of them have, locations in other states or in other countries. And so some of these decisions that you see made isn't just about a new company coming to Georgia, it's about a company deciding to stay in Georgia, deciding to expand in Georgia, to bring, to keep jobs here in Georgia. And in bad times, sometimes companies have to cut back. As many of you know, you own businesses, sometimes you have to cut back. We want them cutting back in other states, not in our state. Um, and then finally, I would say just as to the other seven of those eight who might, I would be curious what their actual reasons were. They probably see, in my opinion, just from talking, I've been working with manufacturers for 25 years, they probably look at everything, like you've heard from our members. They look at, again, the, the economic conditions, the workforce, all these things. They look at the tax system. And so if you just say, well, only, they would only choose it because of the tax system, or seven out of eight wouldn't choose it because of the tax system. If you took it away, or you made it uncompetitive, then all of a sudden you've unleveled the playing field. And I guarantee you, it might not have been the, the one reason they chose to come, but it might be the reason they choose not to. So we encourage you to continue to keep things stable and predictable for our, our manufacturers. We greatly appreciate 
uh, everything you all do. This is a great state, as I've said, and that's about all I have at this time, and I'm going to let the real manufacturers, the people that do the work, uh, talk to you now. So uh, I'll start. Do, do you want to ask me questions now? Or you just, wait just a quick comment yes, on, on your your discussion. I think the one out of eight was looked at at a national level, so it okay. may not apply to Georgia. Okay. It, it could apply to Georgia, but it was that. The other thing, and I said this in the last meeting, I mean, manufacturing is hugely important to the state in this area. We're the furthest up here, Representative Carpenter in my area up here is the furthest from the Savannah Port, but we do the most business <laughs> with the Savannah Port, even though we're the furthest away. And then the third thing is that 12 years ago, we had a similar committee yes, to look at our overall tax structure, and that committee recommended eliminating the energy tax, and then the legislature implemented it. So. For those that think these are just looking at eliminating things, uh, credits, that one was one that, that we felt would be good for business or they felt would be good for business and so then we adopted it in the legislature. Yes, sir, and it certainly was. And I would just add that uh, Dr. Roger Tuttero of Kennesaw State University served on that. Uh, he's been an advisor to us on, on many issues, not at the, just at the PST, but here and, and a lot of the numbers I shared with you today were research that he did to, to share with you. I'll turn it over to Ballard Betts. Uh, or I think I'm next. Okay, Michael, you come on. Good morning. As Clay said, my name is Michael Edwards. I'm the Senior Vice President of Operations for Mannington Mills. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Hosteller and Blackman for having us here today, and thank you for the panel for your time. And also, uh, thank you, Barry, for, for hosting us here. It's a beautiful location. Uh, as well as Georgia Association of Manufacturers. Thank you for your uh, continued advocacy for uh, manufacturing across the state, which we benefit from, we really appreciate. So as I said, I am the Senior Vice President of Global Operations for Mannington Mills, and my wife and I are both life, lifelong residents of Georgia. Uh, we raised our kids here. We sent them to the county schools here in Rome. Uh, one of them now is at Georgia Tech. Go Jackets. The other one is at, Georgia, at University of Georgia. So we appreciate the public services and the infrastructure uh, that Georgia provides, and we, um, we've, we've realized it and we've benefited from it. So I don't need to be incentivized to move here. Uh, my intention for being here today is not to keep, the, is not to keep this state competitive, it, but to, my, not to make us more competitive, but to keep the companies that are here already and have been helping Georgia already be successful to keep those companies here and to aid them so that we can continue to grow. The tax credits that are most often associated with bringing up um, these conversations are about new jobs coming in, new companies coming in, uh, the big headlines, all the new jobs. But uh, I'm all for that, and I've done my share of that, actually. But my focus here today is about the R&D tax credit, specifically. And I'd like to explain how it helps retain the companies that are already here, how it keeps us here, and how it uh, makes us more stronger and how it makes us more competitive. So Mannington Mills, to tell a little bit about us, we are a privately held, family-owned company. Uh, we manufacture flooring. Uh, we have been manufacturing flooring for 109 years, uh, 50 of that here in Georgia. We are entering our fifth generation of family ownership. Our third generation chairman, a World War II Marine veteran who very, very much played the part of that, he bestowed upon us a very short list of core values, one of which is control your own destiny. So we have, which I have learned, has many different facets to it. It's not as simple as it sounds. From building your own technical bit strength so that you can innovate in-house and, and compete on a world scale, which we do, and simplifying supply chains, which we all experienced in 2020, <clears throat> went through COVID, through the freeze in Texas, all those things that happened, how do we shorten that, tighten it up, and make that more predictable? The R&D tax credit has been key to helping us do that and do it here in Georgia. So we've been manufacturing here in Georgia for over 50 years. I've only been doing it for 30 of that, even though it feels like I've been doing it for all 50. But that's all I've ever done is manufacture flooring. I've done it in LaGrange, Georgia, and I've done it here in uh, Calhoun in Rome. I love the business environment here. Uh, we have also grown. Uh, Mannington has grown through acquisitions over time, and that's meant that we end up having a very messy footprint. Uh, we have locations in different states, we have locations in different countries, and we have expectations that we have to feel from, from that. So I've experienced and I know what it means to run operations in different countries and in different states, including New Jersey and California, which were very low on that list. 
I also know that moving manufacturing operations is not easy, and the decision to do so is not something we take lightly. So formulas must be redeveloped for chemistries, must be trialed, equipment and processes must be re-engineered, and technical labor must be trained. That's the kind of things we have to do to move an operation from one state to another. Georgia's R&D tax credit targets those crucial activities. Uh, for that period of time where we are learning and transitioning, it's expensive for us to do that. We, we incur costs, we incur scrap, we incur losses. And having a plan of how to get through that hurdle, how to push through that transition time, is a big part, is a big part of us deciding whether we're going to, whether the pain of a transition is worth the gain we're going to get from making that transition. So Georgia's R&D tax credit is a good tool for me to, in that plan specifically. I have used that to explain to my board of directors that the state we're working in is leaning in to help us as opposed to standing by and watching or even working against us and seeming like it's opposing what we're doing. We've experienced both of those. So Georgia's commitment to manufacturing has made it easier for us to commit to staying in Georgia and expanding our presence here. A couple of examples. In 2015, we invested heavily in our, in our Madison site, uh, which manufactures LVT. Manu uh, LVT is a luxury vinyl tile. If you don't know flooring, like if you don't live flooring like I do, it is the biggest, um, it's the newest product on the market and it's taken over. So we had to adapt, we had to retool, and we had to be able to manufacture that. So we expanded that project, we expanded that site. The process, the project that we did doubled our overall capacity which allowed us to onshore a product that we once made in China, <coughs> in Asia, and it allowed us to manufacture a subcomponent of that product that we had been purchasing uh, from Virginia since 1999. So now we make that in Georgia. The experience with the R that experience that we had during that project with the R&D tax credit uh, kind of gave us the confidence to expand our what we're going to do and lean in. So the in 19, well, I'm gonna get my dates wrong. A couple years after 2015, we actually shut down our R&D headquarters in Salem. That was our traditional headquarters for 109 years. We shut that down and moved it to Georgia. So all of our R&D operations now are uh, headquartered out of Calhoun, Georgia. The, in 2019, based on having those resources here, we were fortunate enough to be able to shut down a rubber flooring manufacturing operation that we had in San Jose, California. We moved that operation to Calhoun. And the R&D resources that we had here in Calhoun, that we have there in Calhoun, allowed us to do that. In 2020, we started up a new, a new operation, making more LVT, different kind of LVT, rigid core, uh, in Calhoun. So we, bought a new, we expanded a new plant, installed new technologies, and now we manufacture that product in Georgia that we previously purchased from Asia. And finally, in 2021, we acquired and moved some additional carpet assets from a plant in Alabama to Georgia. So now we employ 1,500 Georgians, eight different, eight different rural sites across Georgia, producing five different flooring projects, products in Madison, Chatsworth, Dalton, and Calhoun. So I'd love to tell you that all those projects went great. They did not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real challenge to do those large-scale executions and they did not go perfectly and we required a lot of steps back before we were moving forward and so that's what we think that's what I feel builds stronger roots and allows us to kind of grow where we are and R&D tax credits has given us the financial leeway to push through those hurdles that we had to go through and uh, makes us more resilient coming out the other side so today we are not as cheap as China it's going to be a struggle. We're continuing to try to get there. But I don't think they're playing on a level, level playing field, and we think we can get there. But it's going to take additional R&D and additional development here in Georgia to be able to do that. So we want to stay here, and we want to grow here, and I urge you to help us do that by keeping this R&D credit in place. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Tom Grant, I think, down here had one. You had a question first? Or? Oh, I just had a comment. I was just going to say. Okay. Is that okay, is that okay to wait for them? Okay. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Briggs and the Berry College team for making your beautiful campus uh, always available to our community. Uh, by my math, that 30 minute tour is gonna cover about 1,000 uh, acres per minute. <laughs> so you better have your seatbelt on. Uh, thank you, Chairman Huffstetler, uh, Chairman Blackman, and the committee for your state leadership and for your interest in this important topic. Uh, thank you also to the Georgia Association of Manufacturers for being a strong advocate for a vital industry in our state. Uh, my name is Ballard Betts, and I'm a native of Rome and Floyd County. My wife Elizabeth is also from Rome, and we have six children attending Model High School, Model Middle, and Johnson Elementary. We love this small town, and we are proud to raise our kids amongst other faithful, hardworking Northwest Georgians. Uh, since moving back from the suburbs of Washington, D.C. in 2022, I have poured my heart and energy into raising my family and serving this great community. In 2019, I became CFO of the Lewis Chemical Company and a year later, president and CEO. Today, my community service has evolved into more industry specific work, including board member of the Floyd County College and Career Academy, board member and treasurer of the Chemical and Specialties Management Council, and now board member of the Georgia Association of Manufacturers. Uh, Lloyd Averam and his team inspired me to be a stronger advocate, not only for my company, but for all the manufacturers in our state working hard to keep Georgia at the top of the list of best places to do business. 17 years ago, it was our state's pro-business reputation that incentivized my company's founders to walk away from a strong and promising career at Dow Chemical to start up their own R&D operation in Dalton. And a few years later, both R&D and manufacturing here in rural Floyd County. The Lewis Chemical Company develops and manufactures ingredients sold into household institutional and industrial cleaning markets all over the U.S. and Canada. Having made the Inc. 5000 list the fastest growing privately held companies for the 10th time this year, our small business now produces over 1 million pounds of product every week and employs approximately 70 men and women from Floyd, Bartow, Paulding, and Chattooga counties. In 2020, we, the employees of Lewis Chemical, purchased 100% of the company stock from the founders through what's called an e a leveraged ESOP or employee stock ownership plan. Since then, we've been working aggressively to retire our debt early and create a compensation and benefit package capable of competing with the larger industry in our area. I'm proud to say by, by the grace of God, we are finding success and are privileged to return our blessings to the community by supporting local charities, such as Habitat for Humanity, Boys and Girls Club of Northwest Georgia, Family Resource Center, Living Proof Recovery, Mercy Senior Care, Trails for Recreation and Economic Development, and many others. It's important for the purpose of today's conversation to point out that as an employee-owned business, our company is organized as a qualified retirement plan. Employees receive annual stock allocations that they will later sell back to the company upon retirement. Because of this unique structure, our company pays no annual state or federal income tax because those taxes will be paid at the individual level when our employee owners realize their profit upon retirement. So you're probably asking yourselves, if an employee-owned manufacturer pays no income tax, why would it care about tax credits and exemptions? I'll start with exemptions. As a modern-day pension plan for our employees, we have a fiduciary responsibility to build and escrow the cash necessary to repurchase our employees' stock when they reach retirement eligibility. This translates into a relatively more conservative investment strategy for us, particularly when it comes to cash management. Less liquidity for operational investments means that every dollar we put into inventory, property, plant, and equipment needs to be a dollar very well spent. Not only is domestic competition fierce in our industry, but today we are competing against Chinese and Indian imports that defy the laws of economics. How these foreign entities are able to transport liquid halfway around the world and still beat our price is hard to understand. The bottom line is that we are winning or losing business on literal pennies per pound of product. Being able to exempt sales tax on our critical inputs is absolutely essential to maintaining our already razor thin competitive viability. As our country strives to restore manufacturing greatness in the interest of both job creation and supply chain self-reliance, we cannot afford to give foreign competition any undue advantage over our domestic manufacturers. This America First policy applies just the same to tax credits. And while my company may not benefit today from such credits because of our employee ownership structure, I know for certain 
that they were very important in the years leading up to our new ownership as we strove for economic sustainability in our early years of growth. I also know from my years of business consulting and via regular conversations with industry colleagues that these incentives play a very important role in the strategic planning process. <clears throat> Site selection analysis comes down to dollars of investment. Companies make these major decisions not only on the immediate comparative analysis, but just as importantly, on the assurance that these incentives will remain in place once the long road of capturing their return on investment begins. Predictability and continuity are essential, as my fellow manufacturing panel members well know. Once again, thank you for your leadership and proactive interest in this important topic, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. I think next will be uh, Jason. I'm from right here as well. Can you guys hear me? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you to Barry and Dr. Briggs, and thank you to GAM as well. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to input our comments on this. Again, my name is Jason Burleson. I'm the tax director for Pirelli Tire. For those of you who don't know, we're obviously a global tire manufacturer. We're ranked fifth or sixth, uh, depending on what metric you use. We're about six or seven billion in worldwide sales. 1.5 to 2 billion of that is in the U.S., including hundreds of millions of dollars in Georgia. Um, we also, I'll, I'll do a brief overview of where we're at, sort of uh, the history of how we came to Georgia, and then the current landscape of where we're at, including we recently went through a sort of a site selection very recently, so I can give some input in that. Uh, also, we're, we're coming at this from a slightly different angle. We're a uh, multinational, we're based out of Milan, so we're competing internally for money. It's not simply that we're looking at Georgia, Alabama, Florida, or nearby states. The first decision to be made is are we going to put that in the U.S. or could it go overseas? <clears throat> uh, in 2002, uh, Pirelli Milan asked us to start researching some United States locations. A scouting team came here and they looked at several different states. Georgia was chosen for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was competitive economics, including tax credits and incentives. The plan opened in 2002, and today we employ 250 to 300 people in Georgia. Uh, when we built that plant, it was state of the art, and it's still one of our most technologically innovative and advanced plants. Uh, it's Mears Robotics, I don't know, for those of you who don't know what it is, remember the claw we all played with as kids? Imagine 36 of those claws handing heavy, heavy tires to one another. But as part of that, we employ skilled labor to maintain uh, and service those machines. And, and those are high paying skilled labor jobs r right here in Rome. Um, the current landscape, uh, we're currently investing more in Rome, uh, 10 to $20 million at this time. <clears throat> this is not the site selection project I talked about earlier. Uh, we, we, Pirelli has always had a local for local or domestic strategy, uh, meaning what we manufacture local, we try and sell local. Um, so it's, it's not simply that we're building tires overseas and shipping them into the U.S. We've always looked to manufacture things in a local market and then turn around and sell those. Uh, since 2002, we've been aggressive at acquiring market share in the U.S. and figuring out the right blend for the U.S. economy. Um, when we first came to the U.S., we we quickly realized it wasn't like Europe. Uh, in the U.S., we like an all-season tire. We also like truck tires. Um, I recently put our new Scorpion tire on my truck, so if anybody needs new truck tires, I highly recommend it. Um, so recent geopolitical events uh, are also making other, not only ourselves, but other foreign multinationals rethink globalization and, and even more go back to that local, local for local flow. Uh, Due to production demand here in the U.S., there's been a very recent emphasis on this region. And when I say this region, I'm talking Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. Um, which brings us to, to probably the most relevant point of, of my comments here. Um, the global map is always up in Milan. And that global map always has dots on it with where Pirelli locations are. Um, and when you get to the North America piece of that, you'll see a dot in Salau, Mexico, and you see a dot in Rome, Georgia. Um, I would love for that dot in Rome, Georgia to get bigger, um, expand, and, and there's a few things that'll happen with that dot. It's either gonna stay there, it's gonna get bigger, 
It's going to stay the same or it's going to go away. Um, so when Milan starts looking at these, that's the first conversation that's made. You have you know, five to ten guys in a room in Milan, and they're not just looking at Georgia versus Tennessee, Georgia versus Alabama. They're comparing the most closest is Mexico to, to Georgia or, or other southeastern states. So we here in Rome and in, in North America in general, we're fighting for capital within our own company, N not simply saying, hey, I know I want to invest. Where's that going to be in the U.S.? Um, so with, with the recent emphasis on the U.S., we were asked by Milan, and this is within the last year, to look at several locations in the southeast. And of course that started with Rome. Um, so, so I will say when we went through that, we talked to several states, and if you think about where we're sitting right now, it doesn't take too much imagination to figure out who at least two of those other states were. And I will say, Georgia was very competitive. We love Rome, we love being in Rome. It's our intent to stay in Rome. Um, but, but when we looked at uh, a, making a larger facility, we looked at those other locations. And when we started doing the analysis, uh, we were looking at two decimal places. So the hundredth place in, in these investment decisions. And those were the things we're sending to Milan. And so I, I really liked uh, what Nick with Alex said. Hey, if you, if you want to put the corporate rate to zero, I'm fine with that. But the reality is we're probably not going to go there. And the other reality is other states are offering these incentives. And while, while our intent would never be to leave, ultimately, if we opened up a giant manufacturing facility in northeast Alabama, what would that do for what is here? So we're, we're, sometimes we're not only talking about in addition to jobs, we're talking about perhaps shuttering a plant, which I'm not saying that we would do that, that but it, it has to be thought about in, in those terms, I think. Um, I would say this also, when, when we look at staying in Rome, recent things that Georgia have done, has done, uh, impact that. Uh, when I drive in every day, I pass the Hyundai plant that's being built. We have Rivian down here, and a large part of them choosing to be here was credit decisions. Well, that impacts Pirelli's business that's, that's already here. Um, we, we, we have the highest offering in the EV market, whether you agree with EVs or not. Uh, I drive an in, in internal combustion engine car, but they are here to a certain extent. Now we can argue over lithium and, and if they're uh, sustainable or not, but, but they are here and we are investing the, in them in Georgia. And, and that help, you know, we're already here making those electric vehicle tires and the economic climate in Georgia is helping Pirelli to sell more tires to those companies. Um, one, one of the last things that I would say is, is the but-for argument is a good one and the leakage argument is a good one. But I would say when we came here in 2002, what we initially did was put a manufacturing plant here. And if you just look at the credits that we got for that manufacturing plant, that's great. But what that might not capture is since then, we opened a distribution facility in McDonough. And because of that distribution facility, we now bring most of our imported tires through the port of Savannah. And because of that and the distribution facility and the manufacturing facility in Rome, we opened up a, uh, a regional uh, admin office in Cobb County, Georgia. So there are 20 very high paying jobs in Cobb County, Georgia now. Those other things we didn't go and solicit credits for, but, but the initial credit that we got in Rome, I will tell you, certainly led to a downstream investment in Georgia that is not captured in, in any of those metrics. So with that, I, I appreciate your, your time. And that is the ripple effect that people, that you hear about with manufacturing. I'm Missy Kendrick. I am president of the Rome Floyd County Development Authority, and I am bringing the perspective of the economic developer, Boots on the Ground. I am past chair of Georgia Economic Developers Association, and I am currently the Georgia representative elect 
on the board of SEDC, which is Southern Economic Development Council, a 17-state um, economic development organization. So um, I want to thank the panel for having us here. First of all, thank you for coming to Rome, of course. We appreciate y'all being here, but we really appreciate the opportunity to bring you the voice of manufacturing and the ones that, that deal with these credits on a day-by-day -day basis. And I do appreciate what you're doing. What you're doing with this review panel is responsible. It is the responsible thing to do as um, the elected leaders in our state. Uh, fiscal responsibility is very, very important. And I look forward to the results because I really do not have any doubts about the benefits of the tax programs that we have in place and the positive tax policy that has been set in place by our current and our former leadership that put these, these uh, tax credit programs in place. And I really, really do appreciate Allison and, and Nick coming and sharing their expertise and their research with us today. I learned a lot today from the two of them. A couple of things that I learned is that other states are putting into place policies that we already have in place. Um, I learned that from Nick that, um, that they think that we should reduce taxes in a state, but I would submit to him that those states that he uses as an example are able to do that because of the economic development successes that they have had, and that's our role. We have been successful in the state of Georgia because of the tax policy that we have, and specifically and especially in Northwest Georgia. As um, Senator, uh, Senator uh, Huffstetler said, that is true. We have been very, very successful. Just here in Rome and Floyd County, we have had in the last three years over $800 million committed and uh, over 900 jobs committed in the la just the last three years, and that's just in Floyd County. I mean, and also right across the line, there's that little battery, you know, plant that has announced over in Bartow. I won't talk about that, but um, but we have been very, very successful. And you know, as as um, Clay said, it does, you don't have to be an economist or an accountant or even an attorney to recognize that that we have been successful because of the policy that we have in place. Um, but I think it's important to understand and recognize that there's some things that this tabletop research that has been presented has been has been has left out i think it's important to note that all of our tax credits that we have in place are performance based which means that in order to get the research and development tax credit you have to make the investment first or if you, in order to get a job tax credit, you have to create the job first. Or the investment tax credit, you have to make the investment first. So it's like the, the child tax credit that everybody in this room, I assure you, has, has taken the child tax credit on their personal income taxes. There's just this small little thing that's required first. You gotta have a child. So that's where we are with our tax credits is that they're all performance based. Another thing that is so very important to understand is that the tax credit programs that we have in place levels the playing field across the state of Georgia. It provides additional incentives to locate in rural communities because the job tax credit is higher, because the percentage is higher for the um, for locating in those less developed census tracts or in those more rural communities. And just like the child tax credit does not offset all of the expenses that you have for a child by any means, these job tax credits and the tax credits that we provide as an incentive for our either attracting or retaining the industries that we have certainly does not in any way, shape, form, or fashion offset all of the expenses that these industries and companies have just in hiring somebody alone. I mean, it's at the most $3,500 a year per job. If you're in business, how far do you think that $3,500 goes towards the expense of hiring an employee? Not very far. So it is a very small drop in the bucket to just help offset some of the expenses that they have. Um, and it, 
for those that may not be aware, in order to get the job tax credit, these companies have to commit to pay higher wages than the lowest average wage in any county in the state of Georgia. And the reason it was designed that way was to raise the tide. You know, rising tide floats all boats. Any company that takes advantage of the job tax credit in the state of Georgia has committed to pay enough a higher wage rate in order to raise that tide and float the boats a little bit higher. And that's what these programs have done for the state of Georgia, is it has improved the quality of life. It has increased the average wage levels in the state of Georgia. And that was, it was designed that way on purpose. Um, and I think, I don't remember, I think it was Ballard or somebody that mentioned that um, it's part of the game. These incentives are an expectation of companies that are coming and looking at the state of Georgia. It is part of the game. And I mentioned SCDC earlier in the 17-state coalition. Make no mistake, these other states are watching what we're doing. We are the number one state in which to do business. And they are sitting back with bated breath, waiting on us to make some changes that, that will impact our ability to remain the number one state in, in the country to do business. Um, also, very, very important, Georgia is a large state. So we have a lot of border counties in the state of Georgia, all the way from Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina. So we directly compete with these bordering states for projects. And so a lot of these, the existing industries that we have, when they plan an expansion, they're not just looking at us. Just as uh, Jason said, they're not just looking at Rome. They're looking across the border into Alabama. That's who we compete directly with. So these tax incentives these, that we are able to put, put together as part of a package really do make a difference. And especially for smaller expansions, sometimes these tax credit programs that we have are the only thing that's available to them. They're not gonna be large enough for a tax abatement, a local tax abatement, because the cost of issuing the bond is gonna be cost prohibitive to offer a tax abatement locally. So a lot of times these statutory incentives, that's what we rely on to put together the incentive packages to try to incentivize them to stay where they are and expand here in Georgia as opposed to somewhere else. And we have to understand that it's not just cost. Um, a few years ago we talked about um, the, for the ec any economic developers in the room, you'll remember GASB 77 when we put the um, State Accounting Board for audits, put in new regulations that was required to start taking an account of the cost of the incentives in a local community. And it took two years of us working with all of the communities to understand it's not just about cost. It is about the value that an industry brings to a community when they locate. It is the small business impact. And I'll, I'll give you a, a perfect example. We have a company that has announced for Roman Floyd County and they are in the due diligence period of their contract. And so during this due diligence period, you know, we just came off hot Georgia summer, they called us and said, we need somebody to come and cut this acreage and maintain this acreage while we go through this due diligence period. And we said, sure. So we called up the guy that we usually, one of the guys that we usually call, we have a list. And so we called him up and said, can you please go meet them and give them a quote on maintaining this acreage for them during this due diligence period? And he said, absolutely. He said, y'all, I'll call, you can call me any time to do anything like this because I make my living based on what y'all do. So he has a very successful lawn care business based on the contracts that he has with the industries that is located in, that have located here because of things like the incentive programs that we have. So it is, that happens at the Chamber of Commerce all the time. The industries call the Chamber and say, can you get us a list of caterers? 
can you get us a list of, of so-and-so, no matter what, it, attorneys, can you get us a list of accountants? Because they need all of those services when they come to a community. So the value is so much more than the cost of a tax credit. Um, let's see, is there anything else? I made some notes during the, during the thing. Um, there was one comment that Allison said that um, incentive packages have increased over the last few years, and she's right. The incentive packages across Georgia and other states as well, they, excuse me, they have increased, but it's because the capital investment and the job creation has increased. That's what's driving these incentive packages up because they expect more. They know what they're doing. The, the consulting companies that they're hiring for these site searches, um, they are expecting the incentive conversation. And from the boots on the ground side of the thing, the projects that come through our office, incentives is always a part of that conversation, every single time. Now, we have to decide what they qualify for and what they don't qualify for, and we do that. But it is always part of the conversation. So I want to again reiterate to all of the legislators here today thank you for what you're doing thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about the local impact of these um, tax credit programs and I just want you to understand that we feel like this is a wonderful opportunity not just for us but for y'all to continue the legacy that we have in place. This is an opportunity for you to support manufacturing and industry and the locations and successes that we have had over the last few years and to continue to keep the tax policy that we have in place. So thank you very much. Thank you, Missy. And I know we're gonna lose some house members mm -hmm. because of another commitment they've got. So I think they ought to go first on any questions they've got. Uh, we had a, a hard stop, but uh, really some fantastic testimony. So I just want to say thank you, Clay. Thank you for your uh, perspective on economic development, Missy, and all the panelists, uh, not only for, for taking time away from your business to talk to us today, but also for, for doing business here in Georgia. Thank you very much. Any, any questions out of you guys, Casey? Yeah, I, I just actually want to say thank you. I do business with, uh, with all three of these people. We're a caterer out of Dalton, but we do drive down and serve you guys. So I can illustrate the economic impact goes further than just, uh, than just the field that you operate in. So appreciate you guys. All right. Um, no other questions out of the house. So whenever you guys need to leave, I know you're, you've got to be somewhere. Um, I wasn't sure if Missy was for or against tax credits when she finished. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm confused here, but um, I was talking with, with Pirelli earlier. I lived in California. I was vice president general manager of a manufacturing plant 30 miles north of where Pirelli was then. And then when they came over here to this state, I was on the, we're looking at coming over here, I was on the county commission. So having managed a facility that had three different unions in it, including the Teamsters, I could feel their pain from being in California and hopefully help get them over here. But the one thing I do remember with Pirelli, who is our number one, I believe still number one user of the Savannah Port from this county, was um, they paid their school taxes from day one when they came here. They, they said education was important to them. So I, I certainly appreciate um, that perspective from them. Um, questions from the panel here? If you had one earlier, Doc, would you still? Okay. Um, well, if there's no questions, I think uh, Pam needs to give us a little bit of uh, closing information about the, the tour and different things, sort of a housekeeping thing. And we, we, we greatly appreciate everyone being here and all the information presented. We're gathering a lot of information and we got a lot of work to do. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you to the panel. Uh, Y'all did a great job. Um, thanks again to Barry for hosting us today. I think my only two housekeeping things will be if you do want to take the driving tour, the shuttle will be, um, you'll see a shuttle out here in this driveway at some point. And then also, this is a special driving, 
listen up, this is a special driving situation. You cannot go out the way you came in. You have got to go the other direction. So if you will please take the one way and you will go out a completely different gate. Um, so your GPS will get you home from there, but please follow those driving instructions. Um, and if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks everyone for being here and, and for all the participants and meetings adjourned.